the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical Psychology for Today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, voiced by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear more selections from Caravan of Dreams by Idris Shah. This audio has been made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. Encounter with the Devil A certain devout man, convinced that he was a sincere seeker after truth, embarked upon a long course of discipline and study. He had many experiences, under various teachers both in his inner and outer life, over a considerable period of time. One day he was meditating, when he suddenly saw the devil sitting beside him. Away, demon, he cried, for you have no power to harm me, I am treading the path of the elect. The apparition disappeared. A truly wise man passing by told him, sadly, Alas, my friend, you have grafted effort upon such an unsure basis as your unaltered fear, greed, and self-esteem, that you have arrived at your ultimate possible experience. How so? asked the seeker. That devil is, in reality, an angel. Devil is only how you saw him. Brave is the thief who carries a lamp in his hand. Proverb The Beard of the Dervish Syed Khidr Rumi died 1360, who is reputed to have made teaching journeys to England and China in the 14th century is credited with having used this story to illustrate 1. Just because a man may know what he should not do, he does not necessarily know what he should do. 2. People assume that one thing, liking your beard, is the opposite of another, plucking out your beard. This version is from Attar's Parliament of the Birds, written in the 13th century. A certain dervish had a venerable beard, of which he was very proud. He passed a great deal of his time in devotional exercises, but some of his attention was upon the beard, the mark of his gravity. Moses was on his way to Sinai when the dervish stopped him. He said, Please ask God for me why it is that although I am devout and unceasing in my religious duties, I never arrive at a spiritual fulfilment. Moses agreed to do so, and God replied to him, It is true that this dervish is a seeker, but his thoughts are often of his beard. When Moses returned from his communion and related the message, the dervish was struck by conscience. Now he spent a large part of his time plucking out his wonderful beard, hair by hair, and reproaching himself for having considered it as something of importance. Now when Gabriel visited Moses, he said to him, talking of this dervish, At one time he thought too much about the beauty of his beard. Now he is thinking about his beard just as much, even more in fact. The Ants and the Pen This allegory, based upon an argument of Rumi's, Mathnavi, for was used by the teacher Saad al-Din Jabravi, the founder of the Saadi Sufi school. The intention in this version is to admit the usefulness of the scientific, ant, method of investigation, while insisting that another kind of knowledge, literacy, not normally associated with man, must be acquired in order to make sense of life. Jabravi died in Damascus in 1335. 
His tales are still current, accompanied by the argument that allegory is essential to the human mind to envisage ideas which cannot be captured by any other method. An ant one day strayed across a piece of paper and saw a pen writing in fine black strokes. How wonderful this is, said the ant. This remarkable thing with a life of its own makes squiggles on this beautiful surface to such an extent and with such energy that it is equal to the efforts of all the ants in the world. And the squiggles which it makes. These resemble ants, not one, but millions all run together. He repeated his ideas to another ant, who was equally interested. He praised the powers of observation and reflection of the first ant. But another ant said, Profiting, it must be admitted, by your efforts, I have observed this strange object. But I have determined that it is not the master of this work. You fail to notice that this pen is attached to certain other objects which surround it and drive it on its way. These should be considered as the moving factor and given the credit. Thus were fingers discovered by the ants. But another ant, after a long time, climbed over the fingers and realized that they comprised a hand, which he thoroughly explored, after the manner of ants, by scrambling all over it. He returned to his fellows. Ants, he cried, I have news of importance for you. Those smaller objects are a part of a large one. It is this which gives motion to them. But then it was discovered that the hand was attached to an arm, and the arm to a body, and that there were two hands, and that there were feet which did no writing. The investigations continue. Of the mechanics of the writing the ants have a fair idea. Of the meaning and intention of the writing, and how it is ultimately controlled, they will not find out by their customary method of investigation. because. They are not literate. The reading of the ignorant, like a donkey eating a melon which it has stamped into the mire. Proverb When the hawk said that he was simply resting on a ruin, the owls who lived there cried out, He lies. He is trying to steal our home by guile. Proverb Cheating Death Once there was a man called Omar, who was a most wealthy merchant. He had a fleet of fine ships, bringing merchandise from far lands. His line was noble, his honour unsullied. One day, his good fortune deserted him. News came that in a fierce storm all his ships had been wrecked, his sailors drowned to a man. Allah have mercy upon me, cried Omar. Surely this is the worst day of my life. But more was to come. Upon returning to his house, he found that it had been burned to the ground, his stocks of silks and jewels gone, his gold taken by thieves. The servants, unable to face him, had run away. He was alone, no money, no home no personal possessions. Without my treasures I am finished, he thought. I cannot bear to hold up my head among those who respected me for my wealth and position. How in my agony can I start again? It is impossible. And so he decided to take his courage in his hands and cast himself from a high rock into the sea. The angry waters closed over his head and he fell as if into a bottomless pit. But the sea, after half drowning him, cast him up onto the sands. There he lay, blinking up at the sun, in torn and filthy clothes, unable to believe that he was still alive. 
I only want to die, he cried to the unheeding sky. I can no longer live. He picked himself up and staggered through the rocks upon the beach, thinking of many ways to take his life. In the streets of the town where he wandered, half crazed with despair, no one knew him for the once great merchant that he used to be. He was jostled, pushed out of the way, shouted at by little boys. Suddenly there was an outcry. Death to all kings and rulers! Omar heard the voice of a mad, ragged beggar who was brandishing a knife. He stopped to see what was happening. It was at the gate of the royal palace, where the captain of the guard lay dead, slain by the madman. The soldiers seemed powerless to stop the huge beggar, and Omar ran swiftly to help the king as the shining blade rose again in the insane beggar's hand. Without fear, Omar grappled with the man, and they rolled over and over on the marble floor. The guards rushed into the throne room and severed the man's head from his shoulders. Stop, said the king, as Omar tried to run away, bent on finding some other way to bring about his own destruction. Come here, my good fellow, for I must reward you for saving my life. Your Majesty, said Omar, I wish for no reward. I only wish to die. Die? said the king. Why should you die? Tell me all, omitting no detail. My ships have all been wrecked, my house burned, my gold stolen by thieves. I can no longer hold up my head among my associates. Therefore I must find the quickest way to leave this unhappy world. Even the sea refused to drown me. Foolish man, said the king. For saving my life you shall benefit. Is it not forbidden to commit the great sin of taking one's own life? Come, you shall regain all you have lost and become once more high in the land. The king gave instructions to his grand vizier then that Omar was to receive a robe of honour. New ships were to be fitted out for him regardless of cost and all his gold restored from the royal treasury. From that hour Omar became once more respected and honoured, and lost the desire to die. In time, he became so wealthy that he was able to ask for the king's daughter in marriage, and amassed a vast fortune in fabulous merchandise. One day he was walking in the rose garden, smelling one particularly beautiful bloom when he heard a voice calling his name. He turned and saw a tall figure, with covered face and folded hands, standing under a tree. Peace be upon you, said Omar. Whom have I the pleasure of greeting? I am the angel of death, said the shrouded figure, and I have come to take you to paradise. You must come with me now. Oh. No, no, I cannot come with you, said Omar. I am not ready to go now. I have a fine, rich life, everything I need, the king's daughter for my wife. Please, spare me, let me enjoy the good things of this wonderful world a little longer. You must come with me, said the angel of death. I have my duty just like anyone else. Come for I must be off to take the call to other men as well. Then Omar thought of a crafty plan. I am not prepared, he said. Let me go to the mosque and say my prayers, and then I will come with you willingly. After you have said your prayers, you will come with me? You promise? asked the angel. Yes, I promise, said Omar and bent his head to hide a smile. The angel vanished, and Omar laughed aloud. And from that day, Omar never went near a mosque. Years passed, 
and Omar became more and more important. When his first grey hairs had come, he peered at himself in a looking-glass and thought, How distinguished I have become! Surely I am the most important person in the land after my respected father-in-law the king. A servant entered at that moment to say that the king requested Omar's presence at court before the hour was gone. Omar hastened to listen to what the king had to say. My dear Omar, said the monarch, the religious teacher of the turquoise mosque has died, and I can think of no one more suitable than yourself to take his place. Come, let us go together, this being Friday, and you shall lead the prayer at midday. No, no, your majesty, said Omar in anguish. I... I am not worthy. Please, choose someone else, anyone but me. Your modesty does you credit, said the king, but I am now even more decided that it shall be you. Let us hurry, for it is nearly twelve. Attended by the courtiers, the king and Omar walked towards the turquoise mosque. Although the sun overhead was hot, Omar felt as if an icy hand clutched at his heart. His pride left him, and he knew that the angel of death was not far away. They reached the mosque, and Omar led the congregation in prayer. As the faithful bent their knees and rose and knelt again, Omar prayed more fervently to Allah than he had ever done before. He beseeched the Almighty to forgive his great sins in life and have compassion. After a few moments, the angel of death, with covered head and folded hands, appeared to Omar, unseen by the rest. Come with me now, said the angel. I have waited a long time for you, and this is your day of reckoning. All at once, Omar felt a great peace within his heart. He inclined his head. Very well, he said. It is a great relief, after all, to see you at last. I will go with you. Paradise, after all, is the just reward for all true believers after this life on earth. No, not so, said the angel. I am not here to take you to paradise. I came before to do so, but you tricked me, remember, and now you are to be punished. You are to be sent to the lower regions for you have had your paradise on earth. Before Omar could utter a cry, the angel of death embraced him in his chilly arms and bore him away, leaving upon the marble floor a lifeless figure, clad in a priceless robe, kneeling as if in prayer. A nut has a sweet kernel, a date has a useless stone. Proverb no answer is in itself an answer. Proverb The Three Perceptives There were once three Sufis so observant and experienced in life that they were known as the Three Perceptives. One day, during their travels, they encountered a camel man, who said, Have you seen my camel? I have lost it. Was it blind in one eye? asked the first perceptive. Yes, said the camel driver. Has it one tooth missing in front? asked the second perceptive. Yes, yes! said the camel driver. Is it lame in one foot? asked the third perceptive. Yes, 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 said the camel driver. The three perceptives then told the man to go back along the way they had come, and that he might hope to find it. Thinking that they had seen it, the man hurried on his way. But the man did not find his camel, and he hastened to catch up with the perceptives hoping that they would tell him what to do. He found them that evening at a resting place. 
Has your camel honey on one side and a load of corn on the other? asked the first perceptive. Yes, said the man. Is there a pregnant woman mounted upon it? asked the second perceptive. Yes, yes, said the man. We do not know where it is, said the third perceptive. The camel driver was now convinced that the perceptives had stolen his camel, passenger and all, and he took them to the judge, accusing them of the theft. The judge thought that he had made out a case, and detained the three men in custody on suspicion of theft. A little later, the man found his camel wandering in some fields, and returning to the court, arranged for the perceptives to be released. The judge, who had not given them a chance to explain themselves before, asked how it was that they knew so much about the camel, since they had apparently not even seen it. We saw the footprints of a camel on the road, said the first perceptive. One of the tracks was faint, it must have been lame, said the second perceptive. It had stripped the bushes at only one side of the road, so it must have been blind in one eye, said the third perceptive. The leaves were shredded, which indicated the loss of a tooth, continued the first perceptive. Bees and ants on different sides of the road were swarming over something deposited. We saw that this was honey and corn, said the second perceptive. We found long human hair where someone had stopped and dismounted. It was a woman's, said the third perceptive. Where the person had sat down there were palm prints. We thought from the use of the hands that the woman was probably very pregnant and had to stand up in that way, said the first perceptive. Why did you not apply for your side of the case to be heard so that you could explain yourselves? asked the judge. Because we reckoned that the camel driver would continue looking for his camel and might find it soon, said the first perceptive. He would feel generous in releasing us through his discovery, said the second perceptive. The curiosity of the judge would prompt an inquiry, said the third perceptive. Discovering the truth by his own inquiries would be better for all than for us to claim that we had been impatiently handled, said the first perceptive. It is our experience that it is generally better for people to arrive at truth through what they take to be their own volition, said the second perceptive. It is time for us to move on, for there is work to be done, said the third perceptive. And the Sufi thinkers went on their way. They are still to be found at work on the highways of the earth. This podcast is copyright 2016, the Idris Shah Foundation.